One misty morning in January 1899, the spacious corridors of Government House Calcutta were awake and astir. In the high noon of the British Raj, a Viceroy was about to leave and a new one about to take over. The new Viceroy, Lord Curzon, was arrogant because his absolute belief in himself and his contempt for others made him so. A poem satirizing him began, My name is George Nathaniel Curzon. I am a most superior person. At 39, he was the youngest Viceroy ever. Soon after his arrival in India, Curzon met a delegation of Englishmen and Indians. They wanted him to support an unusual scheme, a university of advanced scientific research. It was the concept of a 60-year-old Parsi industrialist with the eyes of a visionary, Jamshachi Nasarwanji Tata. Jamshachi believed that such an institution was essential for the future progress of the country. He had offered to donate half his fortune towards its creation, a sum that in today's terms would be over 20 million pounds. But Curzon was not easily swayed. British power was at its zenith, and each successive viceroy, supreme in his seat, would receive, review, and generally refuse requests for government support. How will you find young men fit to enter this university? And what employment will they find after they've left it? Gentlemen, I find your scheme overly ambitious and wholly impractical. Curzon may have thought this proposal, framed and to be largely financed by an Indian, very presumptuous. But Jamshachi and Curzon had one factor in common, the Victorian era, an era of elephantine but purposeful progress. Each, for his own reasons, wanted India to move forward with British help. But how was it to do so? In time, East and West might meet, but a great gap was still to be bridged. Tatars were one of many Parsi families whose ancestors had settled in Nausari, a small town in Gujarat. The head of the family, Nasarwanji Tata, was a religious, thoughtful man. In 1839, though only 17, he had sired a son and heir. 
Jamshed Chittata, like his father, was formally inducted into the Zoroastrian faith at an early age. Later, like his father, he was ordained a Zoroastrian priest. The ancient beliefs and principles of his forefathers worked in Jamshedji's blood all his life. Years into it, he made his family motto, Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Umta, Upta, Uvrashta. Nasarwanji left Nausari for Bombay. He took some years to settle down and then he sent for his son. Jamshedji was only 13 when he first entered the large tumultuous town which in the days to come he would help turn into a great city. He joined what later became Elphinstone College. It was the early summer of Queen Victoria's reign and reformers such as Lord Macaulay had said that the more British the Indians became, the better. Some might say that Jamshedji was the living proof of Macaulay's intentions. He delighted in the liberal education he received and developed an abiding interest in classical English literature and botany. But he watched his country change. He watched the uprising of 1857 being brutally quelled by the British. The next year, in a ceremony on these very steps, the steps of the Bombay Town Hall, he watched as India was transformed into a British colony. During this time, he married a beautiful adolescent girl, Kirabai. Within the year, they had a son, Torab. Jamshedji was given little time to decide how he felt about any of these events. He was bustled off to Hong Kong and Shanghai to trade in cotton, silks and teas. In 1864, the trade winds brought Bombay a cotton boom. The boom was fueled by the American Civil War, which had caused a blockade of the ships that brought American cotton to England. The bellies of the English cotton mills rumbled and creaked with deprivation. In the end, Indian cotton was needed to keep them and their workers alive. Jamshedji set sail for England to start a cotton agency there. He had been plentifully provided with securities and bills of exchange on the cotton market. But while he was still at sea, the American Civil War ended. The gluttonous Manchester mills resumed their accustomed diet of American cotton. As a natural victim of this heartless change of trade, the Indian cotton market collapsed. Jamshedji was quite oblivious of all this until he stepped ashore in England. Jamshedji quickly discovered that since the cotton market had collapsed, the bills of exchange he was carrying were worthless. He was virtually penniless. Jamshedji came here to the heart of London's financial district where the Bank of England and the Royal Exchange are located. He spent days talking to bankers and solicitors. These shrewd, hard-headed Englishmen were so impressed by his frankness and his obvious integrity, they appointed him his own liquidator. Even more incredibly, they gave him an allowance of 20 pounds a month while he paid off his creditors, which he eventually did in full. Mm -hmm. 
Several Zoroastrians lived in London. Two of them helped shape Jamshedji's future. Dadabai Naroji and Firosha Mehta. They were nationalists but attempted to influence British attitudes towards India by being a part of British politics. They were Whigs, members of the Liberal Party, followers of William Gladstone, four times Prime Minister of England, known as Protector of the Poor. Jamshedji developed a deep admiration for Gladstone, though he was to meet him only once, briefly and by accident. Worldwide conquest and the Industrial Revolution made the small islands of Britain a great power. Steamships and railroads brought the red pieces of the British Empire closer together across the chessboard of continents. Jamshedji visited Manchester, the greatest of the Lancashire cotton cities. He marveled at the efficiency of the mills there, the splendor of the new machines, but its industrial slums were as black and sulfurous as a medieval vision of hell. He looked into England's heart of darkness. Whole families never stopped working through the chilly days and nights of the north. Children scrambled for cotton fluff under roaring machines at a penny a day. It was appalling to be poor in England. After four years, Jamshedji returned home, convinced that the Industrial Revolution had to reach India if it was to prosper in the future. He wanted to build a cotton mill there, a modern mill, not the inhuman kind he'd seen in Manchester, but a mill where men could work as men should. India had been called the jewel in Queen Victoria's crown, but in 1877, the Crown acquired a new status. The British Parliament offered the Queen a promotion. She became the Empress of India. In the same year, the monsoon failed in South India. A monstrous sun dried up the rivers and seared the crops. Famine spawned cholera, which spread uncontrollably. By the time the long catastrophe ended, Five million people were dead. But the messages of death that came from the south were not allowed to disrupt the Imperial Darbar in Delhi, where Victoria was proclaimed Empress in absentia. On the day of this proclamation, Jamshedji inaugurated his most important enterprise yet a great new mill complex in the small town of Nagpur in central India, the heartland of Indian cotton. He thought it apposite to call it Empress Mills. These great structures are now just lifeless shells, but once they were a very important part of Jamshedji's success. The miserable conditions that had horrified Jamshedji in Manchester made him mindful of the welfare of his employees. He provided them with benefits denied to workers elsewhere in the world. Ventilation and humidifiers on the factory floor, accident insurance, a pension scheme, a provident fund, plus free dispensaries maternity benefits, and even a crash for working mothers. Empress Mills throbbed and pulsated with a vitality of its own, a living testament to Jamshedji's vision of an industrial future. The Great Famine in the South, like the brutal quelling of the 1857 uprising, had distressed many Indians. New forms of resistance to colonial rule had started to surface. In the vanguard were Jamshedji's friends, Dada Bhai Naroji and Feroz Shamehta. 
Jamshedji's budding nationalism now began to express itself. He resolved that the yarn that flowed from his new Swadeshi mills would be finer than any British yarn on the international market. In 1887, he founded Tata and Sons. He brought in two young partners, his son Dorab and his wife's nephew, Pratanji, generally called R.D., to differentiate him from Jamshedji's younger son, Ratan. Still only 16, Ratan was to join the firm much later. Jamshedji's mind, always ahead of his cramped times, was brimming with ideas. He planned to develop a miniature Venice in Juhu, complete with canals. He wanted to export Alfonso mangoes to London. He imported Japanese experts to develop a silk industry in Mysore. He even launched a short-lived shipping company, Tata Line. Through it all, Tata and Sons prospered, as did the city of Bombay. The city attracted many foreign visitors, but had only one establishment worthy of being called a hotel, Watson's. But Watson's didn't admit Indians. Perhaps provoked by this, Jamshedji decided to build a hotel far better, far bigger than Watson's, a grand hotel, the equal of anything in Europe. He built the Taj Mahal Hotel with his private funds and he circled the globe to provide his creation with the best amenities he could buy. Even the spun steel pillars in the ballroom came from the Paris exhibition of 1900. Though he'd entrusted the interior design of the hotel to his sons, Jamshedji did recall a slightly dismaying visit to Dorab's rooms in Cambridge. They'd been done in red and yellow wallpaper, designed by William Morris, a socialist painter. Jamshedji advised Dorab, English designers are pretentious. Avoid their abominable reds and yellows. The day the Taj opened, a crowd of a few hundred people gathered at sunset to watch the first public building in the city to be illuminated by the new wonder, electric lamps. Inside the hotel, dozens of servants waited on 17 slightly bewildered guests. But the center of Jamshedji's life was the great family mansion he built on the Esplanade. An English friend described it as a gorgeous palace that deserved a letter to itself. The dining room had a horseshoe table, which connected through a tunnel with the kitchens below. This enabled the servants to emerge dramatically in the middle of the table, laden with food. Jamshedji loved his food. At Esplanade House, he was very much the patriarch. On Sunday mornings, he'd spend time with his nephews. Fortified by cups of ice cream, they would tell him of their week's work. But it was really in the library that Jamshedji felt most at home. He spent a lot of time reading and thinking, and he thought a great deal about his country. The movement towards freedom had picked up impetus but Jamshedji realized that freedom without economic independence was an illusion. In the library was a treasured possession, a scrapbook. The very first entry Jamshedji had made in the scrapbook was a sentence he'd heard spoken by the great thinker Thomas Carlyle in a speech Carlyle had made in Manchester in 1867. The country that has the steel has the gold. For the next 17 years, news about minerals in India swelled Jamshedji's scrapbook. Many reported finds of iron ore proved to be fool's gold. But what almost defeated Jamshedji's dreams were the absurd laws that controlled mining and prospecting in India, designed to discourage private enterprise. Lord Lawrence, Governor General during the uprising of 1857, summed it up tersely. I know what private enterprise means. It means robbing the government. Esplanade House was the first house in Bombay to have electricity, but Jamshedji planned to generate enough hydroelectric power 
for the entire city. Nearly a century later, his dams and electric works still supply the power needs of the city he loved. But at the time, Jamshedji needed government permissions to move ahead. Once more, he came up against a blank wall. Over the years, Jamshedji had visualized three great schemes, steel, electricity, and scientific education, three harbingers of national growth. They had long been ready to fly, but each of them had had their wings clipped by the Raj. His dream of endowing an institute of pure scientific research lay lifeless in a limbo created by Curzon. The Viceroy was determined to curb, as he put it, Tata's overweening ambition. He thought Jamshedji was fishing for a baronetcy. The situation changed dramatically in 1899. Curzon was forced by his superiors to liberalize the mining laws. This was the moment Jamshedji had been waiting for, for almost 20 years. He set sail for England in the summer of 1900. Not far from Buckingham Palace is Whitehall, the nerve center of British government. Located here, with the statue of Robert Clive dominating one end of the street, is the Foreign Office. It was here that Jamchachi had an appointment to meet the Secretary of State for India, Lord George Hamilton. Hamilton was the only man who could issue orders to the Viceroy and know they would be obeyed. Here in the India office, under the watchful eyes of Cornwallis and Warren Hastings, Jamshedji looked to Hamilton to resolve his problems. Hamilton was actually quite enthused by Jamshedji's three stalled schemes. But interestingly, what excited him the most was the idea of India producing its own steel. Jamshedji told Hamilton that if he was to build a steel plant now, at his age, it would not be for personal gain, but only because his country needed it. He also told him of the many obstacles that had been put in his way. On learning of his differences with Curzon, Hamilton assured Jamshedji that he would write to the Viceroy to support him in all his schemes, power, scientific research, and steel. Hamilton kept his promise. Now Jamshedji's only adversary was unconquerable, and it was age. But he rallied himself, as he'd always done, and set sail for America. This was a country of opportunity, new and raw. In spite of his failing health, Jamshedji spent a few remarkably hectic weeks in America, traveling to the major steel towns. Jamshedji's exotic background inevitably intrigued the American press. 
One writer said, he was a jolly good fellow. Another, that he was the J.P. Morgan of the East Indies and that his business partner was the Nizam of Hyderabad. But it was in Pittsburgh that Jamshedji found the man he needed, Julian Kennedy, the foremost metallurgical engineer in the world. Kennedy advised larger surveys and sent him to Charles Page Perrin in New York. Perrin had not expected the sudden appearance in his office of an Asiatic in exotic raiment. But something in Jamshedji's personality compelled the American to listen. Jamshedji said, I want you to take charge as my consulting engineer. Mr. Kennedy will build the steel plant wherever you advise and I will foot the bill. Will you come to India with me? Later, asked how he dealt with such an unusual and unexpected request, Perrin replied, I was dumbfounded, naturally. But you do not know what character and force radiated from Tata's face. And kindliness too. Well, I said, yes, I'll go. And I did. But it was his partner, Charles Weld, who arrived in India first, in January 1903. Charles Weld soon found himself involved in an adventure he hadn't quite bargained for. More an adventure Indiana Jones would have relished. Spurred on by Jamshedji's steely resolve, Dorab Tata and Charles Weld searched the steamy jungles of central India for deposits of iron ore. Guided by unclad tribesmen, they often came across wild animals. Sometimes they rode horses. Sometimes they were bumped along on bullock carts. But mostly they walked. They lived off the land and made their tea with soda water. It was a race against time. Lord Curzon's eagle eye was upon them from afar. He wanted to know what Mr. Tata was doing with the licenses he'd so grudgingly eked out to him. He even prompted a British industrialist, Sir Ernest Castle, to dig for ore in Jabalpur. Jamshedji was not perturbed. His own prospectors had found none. After months of travel and travail, Charles Well decided to call it a day. But Jamshedji adamantly refused to let him leave. In a letter to Dorab, he'd visualized the steel city he wanted to build. A city quite unlike the dismal steel towns he'd seen in America. Jamshedji's mind had taken on some of the qualities of steel. But his heart was beginning to fail him. The doctors advised a cure at Bad Nauheim, a fashionable spa in Germany. Bad Nauheim was famous for the healing powers of its mineral spring pools. Its guest list included European royalty. Jamshedji came to the spa in the spring of 1904. As part of his cure, Jamshedji was administered thermal tub baths. He was made to sip water from the sulphur spring fountains. The healing waters of Bad Nauheim failed to improve Jamshedji's heart ailment. His condition worsened rapidly. As he lay dying, his nephew Adi thanked him for the honor he'd brought to the family name. Jamshedji replied, If you cannot make it greater, at least preserve it. Do not let things slide. He called constantly for his son Dora. 
On May the 18th, Dora and his wife Mehrbai arrived at his bedside. Jamshedji is said to have stroked his son's cheek lovingly, saying, Where were you? Where were you? It was almost as though he'd waited for him. On the following morning, he slipped away in his sleep. It was the 19th of May, the death anniversary of his political hero, Gladstone. Within hours, the news was received in Bombay. Tributes poured in profusely from around the world. The Times of India wrote, he sought no honor and he claimed no privilege, but the advancement of India and her myriad peoples was with him an abiding passion. On May the 24th, at Brookwood Cemetery, in the green and gentle English countryside, the sacred fire of the Parsis was lit. As Jamshedji's body was laid to rest, priests chanted the funeral prayers of the Zoroastrians, first intoned in the ancient Persian city of Persepolis. To many, he was awesome in appearance. Like a prophet escaped from the Bible, one whose visions often came true. The Institute of Science, which he tried doggedly to bring to birth during his lifetime, finally opened in Bangalore, seven years after his death. The names of many distinguished scientists, including a Nobel laureate, have been associated with it, and the progress of modern India linked to it. 2,000 young researchers leave its great gates every year to fulfill his dream. Jamshedji was dead, but his son Dorab and Charles Weld fulfilled another part of his dream. At the confluence of two rivers, the Korkai and the Subarnarekha, Near the village of Sakchi in what is now the state of Jharkhand, Weld finally came across the perfect site for a steel plant. It had taken years. Construction work on the steel plant soon began. When Sir Frederick Upcock, the Commissioner of Railways, heard about this venture, he remarked that if it succeeded, he would eat every pound of steel rail it produced. In 1912, the new factory produced its first ingot of steel. Two years later, the First World War broke out. The Sakshi plants, working night and day, provided the British with hundreds of miles of steel rails for the troop trains on its eastern front. Dorab Tata, now Sir Dorab, dryly observed, if Sir Frederick Upcourt has kept his promise, he must now have slight symptoms of indigestion. At the steel plant, the molten ore continued to flare from the furnaces in rivers of gold. As Jamshedji once heard Carlyle say, The country that has the steel has the gold. In 1919, after the Great War had ended, the Viceroy Lord Chelmsford made a historic speech here on these steps, the steps of the Director's Bungalow in Sakchi. After thanking the Tatars for their contribution to the war effort, he spoke in particular of Jamshedji. This place will see a change and will no longer be known as Sakchi, but be identified with the name of its founder, 
bearing down through the ages the name of the late Mr. Jamsetji Tata. Hereafter, this place will be known by the name of Jamshedpur. Two years before he died, Jamshedji had hired a pleasure steamer in London and had taken it up the Thames to Kingston. Jamshedji threw a lavish party on board to celebrate the wedding of his nephew and partner, R.D. Interestingly, dinner was preceded by prayers and blessings from the Avastha, the sacred text of the Zoroastrians. Never before, west of the Suez, had so many of them assembled in one place. Adi's first wife had died when he was 46. At the time, he had difficulties and differences with Dorab and had gone to Paris to trade in pearls. At his French teacher's house, he discovered a pearl beyond price, the teacher's beautiful daughter, Suzanne, then only 20. When he wanted to marry her, Dorab had objected strongly, but Jamshedji, more liberal, had approved and attended the wedding. Adi was to later change Suzanne's name to Suni, meaning gold, after the color of her hair. <laughs> they settled in Paris, which in the 1900s was already an ancient city, but in its gaiety and charm, it always seemed springtime there. In their favorite cafes, promising young painters like Picasso and Matisse could only afford cheap wine, but got drunk on their own genius. Near the Opera House stands the home that Adi and his young bride Suni occupied in 1904. Every day, Adi would stroll over to the nearby Café de la Paix, where he decorously sipped coffee and read the papers. Jamshedji died in May, and in July that year, a son was born to Suni and Adi. He was named Jahangir. His parents and close friends called him Jay. The rest of the world was to know him as J.R.D. Jay was only 10 when the First World War began and German bombs began to fall on Paris. There were no air raid sirens then, only the sound of fire engines as they clattered down the streets, clanging their bells. Most people sheltered in their cellars, but the intrepid little boy would climb up to the terrace to watch the zeppelins as they floated menacingly overhead. Jay was quite disappointed when the war ended. It forestalled his dearest wish, to become a fighter pilot. But Jay had other, less martial instincts. He loved to play the piano, and he liked to listen to the musicians who strolled the streets of the city, especially when they played his favorite composer, Chopin. Their notes carried to him like drops of liquid silver in the palace twilights. He loved Paris for its quality of life. He did not know then that one day he would be entombed there. In 1922, Adi planned to take his family home to Bombay. Suni had already become a Zoroastrian and she looked forward to their future in her husband's country. 
but she fell ill with tuberculosis, which in those days was incurable. She died in her own country, tragically young, still beautiful, still with her golden hair. Jay spent most of his youth in France. Even though French was his first language, and he was at the time a French citizen, at school they called him the Egyptian. When R.D. arranged for him to be tutored in England, the British called him Frenchy. R.D. later thought of sending him to Cambridge. But, as a French citizen, he had to do a year of army service. Once he'd done that, however, Ardi decided it was time for him to return to Bombay. But Jay always told his friends he wished he'd known Cambridge. He dreamt of its grey colleges, its river and its trees, and in the summer, the girls floating down river in punts like flowers fallen from the trees. Jay returned to Bombay in 1925. George Whittet, who had erected the Gateway of India a year before, had built Tata's new headquarters, Bombay House, in the city's commercial center. Soon after his arrival, Jay joined Tata's as an unpaid apprentice. R.D. brought Jay here to Bombay House to work under John Peterson, the director in charge of the steel company, an ex-ICS man. Peterson showed him how to handle the paperwork and then dispatched him to Jamshedpur to labor in the field. There, Jay discovered that the steel plant had just surmounted a crisis so severe that it could not pay its own workers. To save the company, Sir Dorab had pledged his entire fortune. Part of it was the sixth largest diamond in the world, the Jubilee Diamond, which belonged to his wife, Lady Mehrbai. Before he moved to Bombay with his family, Ardi had bought a beach house at Ardelo, near Boulogne, on the Channel Coast of France. The great French aviator, Louis Blériot, was the Tata's neighbor in Ardelo. He had been the first man to fly across the English Channel. His personal plane often landed on Ardelo Beach. An excited young Jay would watch it arrive and depart. The mystique of flying, the liberation of the open sky, became deeply part of him. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh had become the first aviator ever to fly across the Atlantic. Jay was 23, but he hero worshipped the American pilot as a boy might have done. He drew Lindbergh's aircraft in a scrapbook. Two years later, Jay became the first pilot to qualify for a flying license in India. Even on the ground, he liked to live life on the edge, exulting in the thunder of engines, the sensation of speed. His favorite sports car raced up and down the streets of Bombay, even as the traffic police kept an irritated eye on him. When they tried to implicate him in an accident, Jay went to see the famous Parsi lawyer, Jack Vickerji, whose niece Thelma happened to be lively and lovely. Jay was soon engaged to her. She was thrilled to be marrying such a swashbuckling young man who also happened to be a pilot. Jay's life was shaped by a series of coincidences. A year earlier, he'd met Neville Vincent, a tough professional aviator. Vincent knew that Imperial Airways the precursor to British Airways was planning a service between London and Karachi which would carry mail. He suggested that the Tatars start a similar service between Karachi, Bombay and Madras. Tata airmail services started on the 15th of October 1932 when Jay revved up a Pusmoth in Karachi and flew it, utterly alone, towards this airfield here in Bombay. En route at Ahmedabad, a bullock cart trundled up the runway and four gallons of Burma shell petrol were carefully poured into the little plane. 
Within 20 minutes of Jay's arrival in Bombay, the onward mail was transferred to another Pusmoth and Vincent flew it on to Madras. These were acts of great courage. There were no navigational aids then, on the ground or even in the air. They flew on a wish and a prayer, often from this field, which was really nothing more than a muddy clearing. Jay had dignified it by calling it an airstrip. But Tata Airmail services proved to be enviably efficient. Not once was the mail delivered late. Not once did the overworked Pusmoths ever miss a flight. In fact, the Director General of Civil Aviation was compelled to remark, Imperial Airways might send their staff to Tata's to see how it's done. A year before the start of Tata Airlines, Sir Dorab's wife, Lady Meherbai, had died of leukemia. The following year, Sir Dorab also passed away. He left all his wealth right down to his pearl-studded type in, in a trust named after him. It soon endowed India's first cancer hospital in Bombay. Jay became one of its trustees and guided the trust for more than 50 years. Several years before, in 1918, Sir Dorab's younger brother, Sir Ratan Tata, had died at a relatively young age. He was also a philanthropist, artistically inclined. His unique collection of rare Western art and Chinese antiques formed a nucleus around which the Prince of Wales Museum in Bombay was created. Sir Ratan was eclectic in his philanthropy which extended from supporting Gandhi's early struggle against apartheid in South Africa to endowing a chair at the London School of Economics for the study of poverty and its alleviation. Its first beneficiary was Clement Attlee, who was destined to be the Prime Minister of England when India attained its independence. In 1938, six years after Sir Dorab's death, Jay succeeded Sir Nauroji Saklatwala as chairman of Tata Sons. He was 34. Two floors beneath his office was the office of another young man, Naval Tata, who was the same age as he was and died just four years before Jay did. Naval had grown up in deprived circumstances, having lost his father when he was still a child. When he was 13, Lady Navajbai Tata, Sir Rathan's wife, to whom he was distantly related, decided to adopt him. Having felt the chill of poverty early in life, Naval developed an empathy for the ordinary worker. This was to help him in what became his central mission, reconciling differences between management and labor. He did this not only at Tata's, but also on the international stage. At the ILO in Geneva, he spearheaded far-reaching labor policies and was elected to its governing council a record 38 times. At home in India, his name was also associated with the national sport of hockey. He was president of the Indian Hockey Federation when India won the gold in three successive Olympiads. Within the company, Naval played a unique role. It was the time of the license Raj and constant dialogue with government was a critical part of management. Jay himself lacked the patience for this arduous task, but Naval was perfectly suited to it. His genial, down-to-earth manner melted bureaucrat and politician alike. For them, it was Naval, not Jay, who was the face of the Tatars. The Second World War started in 1939, only a year after Jay became chairman. It stranded a brilliant young Indian scientist from Cambridge, Homi Bhabha in Bombay. Dazzled by Bhabha's ideas, Jay funded his research. The culmination was the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, the cradle of atomic energy in India. When the war ended, events in India took a tumultuous turn. On the 
15th of August 1947, independence and partition arrived simultaneously in a bloody, chaotic and premature unraveling. In the welter of tears, flames and horror that followed partition, Jay's company, Tata Airlines, flew refugees from Pakistan to India and vice versa. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first Prime Minister, was grateful to Jay for this. Nehru also believed that India should have its own national airline. After the turmoil of partition had died down, Jay approached the government with a scheme for an international air carrier. Nehru readily agreed. The first flight of Air India International started from what was now called Juhu Airport on June the 8th, 1948. Jay's first love was flying planes. Managing Air India, he retained the cool eye of a master pilot. He looked into every detail, from the in-flight menus and the interior design of the aircraft to the uniforms of the air hostesses. He once observed that to attribute his interest in airlines to his interest in air hostesses was only a slight exaggeration. Under his eye, Air India became a great airline. The little Maharaja, the mischievous mascot of Air India, became a worldwide icon. A frequent flyer on Air India was Jawaharlal Nehru. Here at Tinmurti House, Nehru's residence when he was Prime Minister, Jay was a frequent visitor. The close friendship between the two grew out of an earlier friendship between their fathers. The sons had spent much time together and remained good friends until Nehru's death in 1964. It was a relationship of equals, but also of opposites. Jay's attempts to advocate free enterprise were met with studied indifference by Jawaharlal. He would gaze out of the window and invite Jay into the garden to see his pet pandas. He once told Jay, never mention the word profit to me. It is a dirty word. In 1953, Nehru nationalized Air India. Even though he was retained as chairman, Jay felt personally betrayed. It was almost as though the government had kidnapped his only child. Jay didn't clash with Nehru or his daughter Indira Gandhi. But he did collide violently with another Prime Minister, the cold and Calvinistic Moraji Desai, who took over briefly from Indira Gandhi in 1977. In one of his first acts as Prime Minister, Moraji Desai deposed Jay as Chairman of Air India. Jay had founded the company had been its chairman since 1932, had made it into a world-class airline, and yet he had to learn that he had been sacked from the morning newspapers. The world reacted to the news with disbelief. To his employees, it was a personal loss. For Jay, the experience was traumatic. He is known to have wept with dismay. All through his life, Jay walked with kings, but he never lost the common touch. He had a way of reaching out to people. <laughs> Even the street children near his office became his friends. He sent many of them to school, gave them clothes and toys. For Jay, human dignity was paramount, and the poverty that degraded it had to be fought. He used the weapon of the companies he headed to fight the war against poverty. He took Jamshedji's welfare schemes beyond the factories 
into the villages in the vicinity. During Jay's 52 years as chairman, Tata's expanded unbelievably. They entered areas as diverse as trucks and locomotives, chemicals and tea production, hotels and software development. But the growth was never at the cost of the core values first established by Jamshedji. As Jay put it, if our philosophy was like that of some other companies, which do not stop at any means to attain their ends, we would have been twice as big as we are today. But he added, we would not want it any other way. Under Jay, 80% of the profits of the parent company, Tata Sons, went to the Tata Charitable Trusts. These trusts in turn started vital institutions, the first of their kind in many different fields enriching minds, adding to the quality of life. As Jay would say, what comes from the people must go back to the people many times over. On the 15th of October 1982, Jay climbed into the cockpit of a leopard moth in Karachi. He was 78 years old and three weeks earlier he'd suffered a heart attack. But it was Air India's 50th anniversary and he was determined to reenact his historic maiden flight. A crowd of dignitaries waited for him here in Bombay. He flew in low but he didn't land. He circled the field and touched down at 4 p.m. Jay was always punctual. If he'd landed any sooner, he would have been five minutes early. Six years later, in 1988, he was honored with the Daniel Guggenheim Medal for Distinguished Services to Aviation. An earlier recipient had been Charles Lindbergh, the hero of Jay's youth. But public recognition alarmed him. In 1992, when he received the Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian honor, his first reported reaction was, Oh my God, why me? In the last months of 1993, Jay developed pains in the chest. The doctors said he had angina. A fortnight later, he was admitted to the Geneva Canton Hospital. Like his idol and model, Jamshedji Tata, he was dying outside the country they had both faithfully served. They were buried far from India, but that was only fitting. In death, as in life, they belonged to the world. What remained of Jay was entombed in the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. The chapel was redolent with bouquets of seasonal flowers, massed in tribute. India sent its ministers and Europe its ambassadors to honor the small coffin. The damp, chilly air was alive with the names of the illustrious dead who kept him company all around. Poets, painters, writers, also his beloved composer, Chopin.
not long before he died in hospital. Between spells of drowsiness, Jay, an adventurer to the end, whispered to a relative, I am about to discover a new world. Then he turned over and went back to sleep.